be some kind of disturbance. I'm gonna go check it out. We request that everybody stays calm at the current moment. Who are you people? I want a coffee! You, 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 you are now two, 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 two. Five, four, three, two, one. Where love and life come together. Come together. From the Spacebird Media Studios, it's Rob San and Ace Unlimited. Welcome back. It's Roxanne and Ace Unlimited brought to you by our friends at Birmingham Mortgage and My Brother's Cup. Lots to catch up on this week. I know that uh, between Oscars and International Women's Day, I want to first and foremost bow (laughs) to Roxanne because she is an amazing woman that does all kinds of things in leadership and faith and marriage and mommyhood. And so just, you know, know that I love you and it's shout outs in, in this direction to you. Thank you so much. I have so many women I admire in life. Thank God that, you know, he put together man and woman. Yep. Ah, thank you for his creative mind. Don't you think that when, when you go to the zoo, you think, what was God thinking in that moment? How did he come up with the platypus and the yeah. rhino's odd looking? I just have to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the analogy of men are like waffles, women are like spaghetti, because I think it's true, you know? <laughs> You mess with one noodle in the whole plate, you know, don't, don't mess with my noodle. You know, got to have a coating of sauce. Guys are one square at a time. It's all good. But uh, as we start each and every week, thanks, of course, for following, subscribing, and helping us to share what's going on each and every Friday. So make sure you tell your friends, and we'll get excited as we jump into this week's topics. As God, as your fortress and your refuge. You know, how often do we really think of him in those terms? We really should. Psalm 91, 2, I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him, I will. You know, a lot of times we say, well, God allowed this. There must be something I need to learn from it. Maybe he doesn't care if I hurt. Mm. And the Lord does care. He does see our tears. He is in it with us. A lot of times I think we think, oh, he's a God above in a faraway land. And uh, maybe he'll get to my problems when he's done dealing with everybody else's problems. Mm -hmm. When in fact he is real, he is now, he never leaves you, and he is in this moment. Yeah. Well, and as I was reading this devotional today, it reminded me of that scene from Superman 2 after Clark is, you know, trying to regain his powers and he goes to his fortress of solitude. For those of us that grew up on Superman, you know what that is. If not, Google it. You'll figure it out real quick. (laughs) But he's standing in the middle of his dark fortress, completely powerless, and he just cries out, Father, just as loud. And, And every time I read this passage, that's the visual I have Because I think that's, we need to have that place of solitude where we are at a point where we have nothing else to give and we feel helpless, we feel powerless, and we cry out to God so that he can answer us. And even, and the thing too about that particular scene is you never hear the audible voice of, you know, Superman's father or anything like that. It's in the whispers of the fortress itself. So, you know, his fortress is his one place that he can go to get away from being Superman. But think about what is that place? Where is that place that you can really tune out the world, tune out all the voices in your head and otherwise that keep you from hearing the voice of God? And perhaps you didn't have the best relationship with your earthly father. Mm. And this is a big leap for a lot of us to make because you hear, oh, God, father, and then the word father may not be the best connotation for you. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing about it. People can disappoint us. They can leave us. They can abandon us. God never will. That's what his word says in, in Hebrews 13, 5. He will never, ever leave. So whatever you're going through right now, he is truly your fortress. Yeah, we have to that. remember that. Well, and I think if we're going to have peace in our life, there are certain steps that we need to be taking. And the first of that is to have peace with God, to begin that relationship with him or to restart that relationship so that we understand that our inner peace does come from him. And Christ, let's remember, paid a big price for that peace. You know, he took on the sins of the world. I don't know anybody else who would be willing to do that. That right. It's bad enough to have our own sins, but to take on everybody else's is rather mind-boggling. He was willing to do that because it was the will of the Father. So we need to make peace with God. Another is peace of mind. 
you know, we think we can hide things from him. Well, I'm thinking that maybe you won't know. Well, he already knows and he knew you would. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that's the thing. So you and I are big with our, I, you know, our Apple watches where it keeps our steps and keeps us in check and you can share your, you know, ring goals with other people. So there's accountability. And I was looking at mine from like a couple of weeks ago and realizing how many steps that led to how many miles by the end of a week. Whereas if you had told me at the beginning of a week, Hey, Ace, I want you to walk 27 miles this week. I would look at you like you're crazy. I'm like, I'm not, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, in my mind, I'd be like, I'm in Georgia, you know, which is not <laughs> actual geography, but in my head to think about 27 miles is a lot, but to think about day to day, a little bit of exercise, a little bit of daily, you know, just walking from, you know, the grocery store to the end of the parking lot, whatever it is, by the time that has happened after seven days, you see how much has, has accumul accumulated. And the same thing with our relationship with God. Every day is a little bit of step, a little bit of action, so that then we look at our relationship a week from now, two weeks, a year from now, how much have you grown closer to him in those steps? One way to have peace is to call Birmingham Mortgage Group. I know I had the most complicated mortgage situation. You know, when you <laughs> have blended families and properties that you own and things that need to go down, without Birmingham Mortgage Group and Turin Newell specifically, I would have been in a lot of trouble. Yeah, same. Well, and I think, too, the part I love about Turin's heart is, you know, he loves the Lord, so his business is ran that way. But he also finds the programs that work for families that other mortgage companies are not able to find or they don't know about. So he's looking out for you beyond anything. Whether that's a USDA loan, a conventional loan, a construction loan. If you're a first time buyer and a lot of folks with these interest rates of today say, oh, I can never do it. I want you right now, if you've dreamed about getting into a home, to just call Turin. Don't, don't. Look at the God possibilities, because this mm. guy, he knows the programs, he knows how to do it. And if you aren't in a space to do it yet, he counsels people to yeah. get into the place where you can buy your first home. Nothing like it. So go ahead and make that call today, 205-259-1656, 259-1656. Or go to BirminghamMortgage.com. And Turin is marvelous. We love him, and he helped yep. both of us to get into our homes. Perfect choice. Yeah, you need you need a good friend when it comes to the mortgage. That's, again, back <laughs> to peace of mind. Honey, who are we going with? Oh, I know. And you know where you're going with that. And um, maybe this week is the week that you've been hopefully dreaming of this year being you starting your dream job or just starting a job that you love in a place that you love. How can we tell? I know we talked about toxic work environments last week. But what is it when we go on the interview that's a red flag or even a beige flag for us to go, yeah, I don't think this is going to be for me? I wish I had known these things. You have to pay attention to the vibe that you get, that that Holy Spirit tap yeah. that says something is out of alignment. You know, a lot of times we'll feel that, but we won't really know what it is. And you've got to watch also for signs of disorganization and they're all around you if you just observe. Mm -hmm. If they're 10 to 15 minutes late getting to you for the interview, may not be good. Yeah. Well, and even too, I've had this happen on interviews where they ask you your weakness and then you ask where, like if you put it back, say, you know, well, where's an area that you feel like that I would really plug in well? I've had interviews where they go, well, I don't really have any weaknesses, so you would just be doing whatever I told you to do. And I remember walking out of an interview going, thanks, look both ways before crossing the street. I'm out of here. You know, it's like, wow. So, yeah, you have to you have to let your hunches and the Holy Spirit kind of go. Yeah, mm -hmm, let's go. You know, pay attention. Do you feel respected? Mm. I, I really wish that I had known that to really look for, even if you're really not qualified for the job that you're interviewing for. If you're meeting with someone and they can't find anything on the pieces of paper in front of them that, yeah. th that could be a positive that they want to mention to you and you leave feeling defeated, mm -hmm. I don't think that's a good idea. Well, shouldn't you walk out of an interview feeling excited like, oh, my gosh, I really want this job, God, please, please, please. 
you know, because I'm a full believer that God doesn't, you know, open doors. He kicks them off the hinge. And if it's truly meant to be your job, it's, it's not someone else getting your job. It's, that's the one that he preordained for you because of your skills, of the timing, of all of the benefits, the work environment. And I'm a firm believer, and feel free to disagree with me on this, don't settle in your salary negotiations. Like when they offer, like sometimes you could get a really sweet offer, you're like, oh, you know, <laughs> still have the game face, but then kind of let them feel like, okay, well, yeah, let, I'm going to go home and talk this over with my wife and pray about it. And, you know, can we, can we talk tomorrow or by the end of the week? That way you're not just going with whatever's you know, laid in front of you. Even if you're like, well, I've been unemployed for a year, Ace, I need a job. Okay, I get that. But again, don't devalue yourself in the process of just going, well, this is all I have in front of me. And maybe it is what God's offering for you. And that may be the salary that you go with. But I think a lot of times we set our value of what we're bringing in. And then we go, well, they're only paying me this much. So this is how much work I'm going to give them. You know, it, it, it just dominoes a lot of different pieces walking in to what could be a very good position, or you've set yourself up for failure because you walked in not recognizing these bad negotiation options opportunities. I agree. I think they expect there to be a negotiation. Yeah. I think they're going to come at you with a lower figure. Sure. And see how you respond to it. And I think, again, if if you feel you have value, you'll be treated with value. So we got to plunge into this. You and I, when we were talking about doing a podcast, said let's go into places where before we didn't have the freedom to have a real open and serious discussion. As we bring out a glass of wine later tonight in this household. Right. So the question that we asked, did Jesus drink wine and should we? And before everybody gets woolly and shaky and goes, what have they done to my podcast? Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful article at IBelieve.com written by Britt Mooney, who is a missionary and a pastor in Georgia. And he just gets real on this topic. Did Jesus drink wine? Now, He says Jesus never condemns anyone for drinking alcohol or wine. He says there are several scriptures that indicate directly that he believes Jesus drank wine. Yeah. Well, and the thing to remember for that time and age, they didn't trust the water from a health perspective. So with fermented grapes, they knew that it had killed all the bacteria and everything, and you could trust in that better. But the thing that I, it's actually funny that this is something we're talking about today, because I've kind of been swimming into a Bible study just before Lent started about what it truly meant in understanding him changing his first miracle being water into wine. Because if you think about, you know, the family of the, of the wedding brought out their best wine and ran out of it. And then people who tried the wine that Jesus created out of the water, they said it tasted better than the family wine. And think about the spiritual connection there of how Christ is always re he's upping our game by making us better than what came before us. So we are God, we are his wine. We are constantly in a state of being fermented and growth and changed and all the toxic stuff is out of us, you know, but I love the idea of that. If it, and again, maybe you come from an alcoholic family or it's a trigger for you because of something in your past. So you stay away from it for that. And that is between you and God. But again, when it's not like if you're giving it up for Lent or if you did dry January, I'm a firm believer. If you can give it up for 30, 40 days, then you don't have to give it up all year. And it is something in our house that is a relaxer. It's a conversation starter. Uh, Sometimes it's a date night, you know, all of those things. But we don't have to be intimidated when we're around other people who are drinking. Now, the Bible explicitly states that we should not be drunk. Don't be drunk with wine, but filled with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians Mm -hmm. 5, 18. You know, Noah got himself in a lot of trouble being drunk. And there are examples in the Bible of that. And and I yeah. do believe, you know, there's a friend of mine that, that really can never drink or use drugs again. And if she's in my home, am I going to whip out a glass of wine? No, yeah. I, I don't partake in drugs, but am I going to do something that would cause my brother to stumble? No. Uh, but I have great respect for people who've chosen not to drink. Mm. I, 
I do. I have great sure. respect for it. If God has shown you that that's not what you need to be doing, terrific. Uh, he's been very clear with me about the occult. I am not to go to a palm reader. I'm not to have a psychic say stuff to me. Right. Now, that's between me and God. I believe it's biblical that I shouldn't expect somebody to tell me what's going to happen to me three weeks from now. And when I was in rock radio, I mean, there was a psychic on there who read my book, who told me things nobody knew. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. but I have to wonder with discernment, where is that coming from? Right. Am I to get my knowledge about me from anything but God for me, the answer is absolutely no. Of course, I, yeah. I wasn't a believer at that time. It scared me, to be honest. You think, sure. oh, that's cool. But when it happened, it scared the daylights out of me to be. And it, what he revealed was a very unfortunate thing in my life. Right. So when I became a believer, you know, I was very interested at one point in astrology. And the Lord said, pick up all those books and take them out to the dumpster. <laughs> well, and what do you say too? I mean, I, the thing I love about that is that you're in tune with God's voice enough to know that that's him telling you not to do it. But again, we don't need one other voice giving us lies. And again, going back to should Christians drink or not, the bottom line is anything that gets between you and God is a vice. So if for you it is alcohol, then yeah, for you, you shouldn't. Or if you have family that comes over and it, that's their thing, then you shouldn't drink in front of them. But if, you know, for me, the, I've learned the hard way that the very things that I love and are gifts from God, like music, can easily get in the way of my relationship with him. I could listen to the wrong band or song, or I could, you know, fixate on the wrong lyric and, you know, let my life be dictated by, well, I'm going to live my life and party like a rock star. You know, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, there are those things that I believe God points out. You're not to do these things or you're not to go down these paths because it takes you away from me. So if drinking takes you away from God, then yes, that's between you and him. If astrology is that thing, then yes, you can't do those things. But find out what is the thing this year or this Lenten season, what is the thing that's keeping you from having a closer walk with God? Because the whole point of Lent is to get closer to him, right? Well, and I used to hear he's a jealous God, and I would think, why would God be jealous of me? He wants to be number one. He wants to be the one we run to. Yeah. And there's so many reasons why we're much better off doing that. And so I just love that we could have that discussion. Thank yeah. you, Lord, that we can have that discussion. Now, let's talk about deep platonic love. You know, it's so funny. We have a guest that talks about your Aunt Bertha, and you shouldn't treat your Aunt Bertha like you're going to treat your husband. But I'll tell mm -hmm. you what. I have really been blessed in such a big way with the most wonderful friendships that it, it feels like I'm in love, like the clock's ticking until I get to talk to you. Mm. And I just want to praise God for great platonic relationships where you can be you. You can be you and you're rotten. You can be you and you're good. You can be you and your weakness. You can be you and you're not judged. Mm -hmm. And I just want to thank God that I finally feel like in this advanced age that I have real friends that love me and there's nothing like it for yeah. me having boyfriends or men or dates. That was no problem. In fact, I was pretty rude. I used to get me a man and like washing my hair, get me a new one when I didn't like him. That was really bad. Pre Jesus. No, I, yeah. thought, I have men, but I have no friends now. God's gifted me with the, the platonic gift of incredible connection. And I'm so thankful. And my husband tells me, you're not brave if sometime on the podcast, you and Ace don't talk about the origins of your friendship because it's a fascinating story. I said, babe, we only have 30 minutes. That would take an hour and a half. The short of it is we didn't like each other for a while. <laughs> then we did. And now we love each other. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the pop-up book version. No, I will say this, though, and, and this goes for any friendship. If you're wondering why your friendships are the state they are, what kind of boundaries do you set, meaning how much do you let them drain you? 
How much do you drain them? You know, what words do you allow them to say to you or about you, whether in your presence or out of your presence? Not, not that we can control what people say when we're not away, but, you know, words always find a way to get back to them. And I'm, and we've said this on this show, even in the last few weeks of there are relationships that God takes you out of because he was present in a conversation that you were not. Oh, well, no, no, repeat that. Well, repeat that. So God removes people from our lives or removes us out of relationships because he was present in a conversation they had about us that we weren't there. Whoa. So he's hearing things that we're not privy to. And so when we go, well, God, why has this person left me? Well, they're the person that's dr drowning you down and, and taking you to places that you shouldn't be going and doing things you shouldn't be doing that gets in the way of my relationship with you or with people that you should be investing into or that want to invest into you. So the thing that I will say, too, because this is where I think we have to talk about is the safety of our spouses about our friendship, or if you have friendships that are platonic and safe and you've had them your whole life, well, you're not going to tell me I can't be friends with them. I mean, Tawny and Wayne are 100 percent on board with our friendship, with our time together, with our show, with our content, talking about them on the air, like all of these things. We don't just open the mic and go Bleh, and then <laughs> have, you know, and then go upstairs and go, uh, you didn't listen um, today, did you? <laughs> you know, it's not that kind of thing. It, it is a, they understand our need for each other professionally and personally. But again, it's because our show from the very beginning was built on our friendship because we had no friendship. And so to have it was a <laughs> gift. I mean, really, it was, yeah. it was, it was bad. And it really was all about misunderstandings, which a lot of times I've, I've actually, it's kind of ironic. I've got probably you and two other good friends, they're guy friends. But we started out on the hate trail before <laughs> we became besties, all because of misunderstanding. And a lot of times that's where we are. We have weird boundaries, we have weird misunderstandings, and we don't have the proper friendships. But I tell my wife all the time, well, not all the time, we've had this discussion early enough on that now five years into our relationship, it's, it's a joke, but it's true. I know that if something happened to one of us, the other one would have a long, there's a long line that, that we know exists of people waiting for us to be single again. So the, there's no jealousy. I know that there's always a man ready and some cases, maybe a woman ready to take my wife away from me if they thought they had what was in them. But I'm confident enough and it goes both ways on the opposite side of the coin, but I'm not intimidated by it. I'm not responsible for my wife's happiness and vice versa, but we do trust and respect each other to say, hey, babe, are you cool if I go out with my friends? Or, hey, are you cool if Roxanne and I have lunch on Sunday? You know, whatever it is, but it's understanding those boundaries with safety. And if there's a past that you have with cheating and affairs and things of like that, you got a long road to get to a place where your spouse may be okay with you having a platonic friend. But that's how God works things out. But we will celebrate it with you because that's what this show is based upon and what it will continue to always be about week after week. One quick story before we go about a DoorDash driver. I really wanted to give get your opinion on this, specifically Ace. Yes. This went, you know, over a million views on TikTok. The guy drives for DoorDash, which I'm very familiar with, have used, have family mm -hmm. members at DoorDash. So it's kind of on my mind. Well, this driver delivers sushi seven miles away. He goes ahead and delivers no tip. He gets mad and he videos him calling the guy and saying, why didn't you tip me over the sushi that I drove seven miles? I'm mm -hmm. pretty upset. I'm about to have a baby. Where's my tip? And the guy said, well, I really can't afford a tip. You know, many responses to this saying a tip should be automatic saying a tip he shouldn't have accepted the DoorDash if he knew there wasn't going to be a tip. I guess you can tell that there's not going to be a tip before you can take the DoorDash. Yeah. Still others that say, if you don't tip, it's a horrible crime. I mean, where, where do you fall in all this? Well, having a daughter who DoorDashes, I am a firm believer that you got a tip because every time we use DoorDash, I think of her, you know, and I, I know places she's been and she's delivered everything from a quick little sushi meal to, you know, a $600 TV. Like it's all over the gamut. 
and sometimes they tip and sometimes they don't. So because of that, I'm very super sensitive that yes, I should tip. But my wife was in the food industry for a long time working, you know, for Starbucks. So understanding that side of it as well kind of puts me in a different mindset. So I always want to be the good tipper. But there's a there's a great book uh, by John G. Miller called The QBQ, which is the question behind the question. In the first chapter of that book, he tells the story of this very busy restaurant that he went into. This was you know, pre-days of anybody delivering food to your house. But he said he went in on lunch break. There was like one little corner booth. He came in, he told the waitress, he goes, I want, you know, chicken salad sandwich, you know, fries and a Diet Coke. And she goes, well, we only have Pepsi. And he goes, he goes, I'll drink water then, but you know, I, that's all I want. And so she's like, fine, I'll get it right out to you. Well, she comes out, brings him his food, brings him his water. He's eating it. He gets about halfway through and over his shoulder, a Diet Coke and a bottle plops on his table. And he's like, where did this come from? She goes, well, on my break, I ran across the street and got you a Diet Coke. And in that moment, he was like, this, this is the kind of person that needs to be running our businesses and maybe our world. Because they think about how can I go the extra step? So even if you're door dashing and you don't get tips and I understand it's all you have to live off of, still be excellent in your work because God's giving you door dash as your income. So while maybe 1% of the houses that you're delivering to don't give you a tip, still give it with excellence so that it's again, providing for yourself or providing for your family. Well, it's wonderful. You mentioned that because there's another video of a guy who got mad that didn't get tipped that took the person's food and gave it to the homeless and videotaped that. They say it was a stunt, but a lot of people were like, yay. And I totally disagree with that. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not a fan of of laundering because the internet's forever. I'm not a fan of bashing a customer or your business or any of that on social media because it, I mean, when you go, you know, we talked about interviews today. If you go back and they want to go and look at your social media profile and they see you bashing a boss or bashing a client, you're probably not going to get hired. And, you know, you, you got to think about the forever. Well, I got to have a place to vent. Okay. Social media is not it. You vent to the Lord and let him work it through you. Or you vent to a friend offline in the privacy or with the counselor or talk to your pastor or, you know, put on a good metal record and just, <laughs> I mean, there's therapy in there somewhere, but <sighs> it just can't be in that vein. And also pour yourself a hot cup of the Roxanne blend of coffee with a little bit of pecan. Uh, that will just, mm, that's the best way to start your day. And it sends missionaries around the world. It spreads the gospel of the good news of Jesus. It can be found at mybrotherscup.com. Click on the Roxanne blend. And when you give it as a gift, it's quite obvious that it supports ministry. And mm. so it's truly special. Thank you in advance for your purchase. It is Roxanne and Ace Unlimited, where each and every week we like to think about relationships because, you know, Roxanne wouldn't have been married as long as she has if, you know, there wasn't some help along the way. I would, <laughs> you know, even though it's marriage number three, I got to get it right this time. So we're bringing in the experts. Yes, she is a speaker and author who encourages women to be happy moms. She's written a number of books. She's appeared on Fox and Friends and the Today Show and is willing to spend some time with us. And we're so thrilled to have her on the show. We welcome Arlene Pellicane. It is my delight to be with you. Thank you, Roxanne. So for marriages that feel like they're doing it right, we'll start there. Because if you're doing things really well, you just build on that. How do we encourage or what's the next step, especially coming after the pandemic? Like every marriage relationship is finally, I think, at a place where they can breathe again. They're not on top of each other for, you know, every day, all day. Right. What is the next step for that marriage that's in good condition? Oh, I love that. You know, it's it's kind of the question of, you don't have to just stay at the same level because sometimes we're just maintaining. We're like, phew, we made it here. Let, you know, let's be here. 
but there's always, you know, just a little something where you can grow. So just have your eye towards growth. This does not mean that every day you have to be like, okay, now what are we going to do for our marriage? We've got to exponentially, we've got to 10 X this thing by next month. You know, that's not the kind of pressure you need to put on yourself, but just put it in your heart that we are going to continue to grow one way or the other. We're either going to grow you know, further apart, or we're going to grow closer together. And these are just incremental stages. And so this might look like planning a date night. This might look like planning a getaway, like an overnight getaway. Like what is within two hours of your home? That would be a really fun getaway for you guys to have 24 hours together. And why don't we schedule that in the next few months? So just looking ahead towards how can we carve out some special time just for the two of us? And then how can I maybe encourage you if I'm the wife to think like, you know, what's something I can do that's, you know, sweet to you in the next week. So just these little gestures and planning that show we are invested in this. We are in this for the long haul. And we know that if we can take care of each other in our marriage, you know, our life is going to go a lot better, but you are so right. Ace that now, you know, it's like, Oh good. We can, we can breathe. Those are mm -hmm. good things. And I, and I think it is fine to really enjoy and be grateful for exactly where you're at and to celebrate the small wins. You know, maybe you've been really on each other's nerves and you've gone three days without fighting. That's something to celebrate. That's something <laughs> to say, hey, we, we're doing great. We're doing great. You have three secret ingredients for a healthy marriage. We would love to hear them. Yeah, we've kind of alluded to some of them. One is date night. So during National Marriage Week, which happened back in February, research came out from Brad Wilcox and Jeffrey Dew out of the National Marriage Project about the value of date night. You know, so that sounds like, oh, so like, yeah, duh, go on dates. But what they did was when they researched it and they asked couples, they found that 52% of couples in America do not date. So that means we never go on dates or maybe just a few times a year. And 48% said, yeah, we go on dates at least once a month or more. And what they found was that the couples who dated at least once a month, what they found was things like marital satisfaction, not likely to divorce, um, happy with each other physically, able to communicate, like all those kinds of benchmarks. They got a 15% boost all across those benchmarks if they simply went on a date. Like that's pretty easy once a month to go on a date with one another. So one of those secrets is you fall in love over and over again with the same person. And one of the ways to do that is by date night. So secret number one is, is use that date night, have it at least once a month, make it creative, make it something you can count on, something to look forward to. It's supposed to be fun. It's not a business meeting. It's, you know, it's not where you air your grievances. It's not where you get mad at each other. It's not like, finally, I've got you. So I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong. That's not date night. So that first thing is date night. The second thing is speaking in your spouse's love language. So I've written books with Dr. Gary Chapman. I'm sure you're very familiar with the five love languages. The book I have with him is called Screen Kids and finding out your spouse's love language. So let's say it's physical touch that they love to be hugged and they just love to be close to you. But let's say your words like me. So all you're doing is talking to your spouse and your spouse is like, I feel no love because you are not like ever touching me or like holding my hand or anything. So not only knowing your spouse's love language, but actually speaking it, right? Because it's one thing to know like, oh yeah, you like acts of service, but you know, I haven't done anything for you for about a month. So <laughs> knowing the love language and then also speaking the love language. And then the third one is really making that commitment to growth of how can we grow closer? Kind of the idea of um, what's new on your marriage resume. Like if your marriage had a resume, is there anything new on it in the past five years? Or is it basically, oh, we have the same skill set that we've had this whole time. But, you know, is there a new restaurant that you've tried? Is there a dance class that you've tried? Are you saving money to go to, you know, this island location? Like what's new? on your marriage resume? Are, are you listening to a podcast, maybe a marriage podcast together? Are you reading a marriage book together or a devotional together? You know, it could be any of these things, but what's new on your marriage resume and commit yourself to growth. So you talked about date night, which Roxanne and I are very big fans of her yeah. and Wayne have date day. <laughs> and then my wife and I just sneak it in when we can. Yes. But I feel like there's also certain rules within date night. Like you talked about, you know, jokingly, you know, not to, you know, bear our grievances. But I also yeah. think like, you know, my wife and I make it an intention not to talk about the kids for like at least 
the first, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes right. of the date, you know, uh, because again, if we're having the same conversations that we would have at home, then you just stay at home or you don't have conversation at all. And we're, you know, two right. screening it where the TV's on and we're scrolling <laughs> And yeah. nobody says a word. Or are there other do's and don'ts within date night so that we maximize those dates? Um, David Clark is a psychologist and an author, and he's got a book. I think it's called Kiss Me It Like You Mean It. And I love how he says when you go on your date, it's not supposed to be a nice time like you have with your Aunt Bertha. It's not just supposed <laughs> to be like we had we had a nice time. He's like, it's supposed to be fun and lively and you kiss and you hold hands and you know, you use that spark, that kind of thing. So I do like that picture. And it is hard to do sometimes because when you're newlyweds, this comes so naturally. And then when you've been married for a while, you know, my husband and I've been married for 25 years. It doesn't almost 25 years. It doesn't come as naturally to be like, oh, let's, you know, kiss. And, you know, we always joke that if we're out on a date night, like we're having dinner and you see two, two people, right? And they're park bench and they're totally kissing and stuff. And you're like, they are not married. Those people are not married. <laughs> so part, I think of the magic of date night is to really think like, okay, how can I take one step closer to being romantic with my partner, with my husband or my wife? And then, you know, like you say, not to make it a business meeting, make it something, you know, on the calendar that's regular so you can count on it. So it's not like, gee, I wonder if we'll ever have this. Like part of it is anticipation of knowing that, hey, on Friday night, I do not have to cook. Like someone else is going to cook for me. I'm going to go out. So I think that anticipation there, there is something for that. Now, if you're very spontaneous and that's the way you roll, then that's totally fine too. But knowing it's coming, I think for a lot of people that feels really good. And then making it interesting, you know, and, and it is hard because you get kind of in the rut of like, we're going to dinner, we're going to a movie. What else do we do? You know, whether it's like going line dancing or, you know, going to the park and, you know, doing Tai Chi. I don't know, like something totally <laughs> crazy that you would never do. You know, I, I've seen we saw people lawn bowling and we're, we're getting old, but we're like, we're not that old yet. You know, So just like looking for things maybe a little out of the norm, you know, it's your local, uh, you know, it's the zoo or the aquarium or a coffee shop you've never visited or going to listen to music or going to a concert or going to an outdoor concert, just something that's a little out of your norm. Those are great kind of practices when you're thinking about planning your next date night. Finances, we got to talk about that. I always hear it's one of the number one things we argue about. How yeah. can we get better about coming together about finances? Yeah, Shanti Feldhan, my um, friend, she's got an amazing book and research about love and money. And she talks about money. It's not really about the money. Like we think it's about the money but it's more about the value that we place on it. So you get an argument, let's say my husband, he loves to ski. I don't ski at all. So he'll spend all sorts of money, like on skis and boots and lift tickets and everything. And I could be like, how can you spend all that money? Blah, blah, blah. But then I have to realize, wait a minute, your value is this is something that really brings you a lot of joy in your life. It's something that we do with our kids. It's something. So then I realize, like this, you don't do this because you spite me, right? You do this because you really enjoy this. This is a value. And when I, if I attack you doing that, I'm kind of attacking your hobby, <laughs> you know? So, so these are things to talk about, like, what is this really about? And there's also different money personalities. And to understand that some of us are savers, some of us are spenders. And a lot of times we marry each other. And to realize that for the spender, they might have to say, you know what, honey, you're right. Like we should be saving more money and I'm going to pull back 25% across the board. And then for the saver, they might have to say, you know what, honey, we don't have to take this all to the grave. We should probably have a little bit of fun now. <laughs> and if you want to plan a weekend vacation, I will be quiet and we can do that. So it's, it's, it's communicating, it's understanding your styles, and it's also understanding this person isn't against me when we have these money, you know, confrontations, but trying to understand why is this important for you to spend the money or sp save the money and for what reason and try to see each other's point of view. Yeah. Well, he and I know a lot of times too, when it comes to finances, it also comes from either being in relationships where it was mismanaged or maybe they just thought growing up, well, dad just paid all the bills and yes. mom cooked the meals, you know, when that that's not the case at all. They were probably having the same arguments yes. that we have now, um, what is that like? You know, they say there's the free spirit and, you know, the the tightwad. And I love how Dave Ramsey says, you know, if you spend every dollar on paper before the month begins, you're more likely to have a marriage at the end of the month and some money to go with it. So right. 
in in that, how do we identify what our roles are in that and, and to get over the hump? Because a lot of time people just, you know, I don't want to talk about this and they leave the room and then there's still unresolved things, which only makes it worse. Yeah, that you do have that family of origin, like how you were raised, you bring that with you. And I think the first thing to recognize that, to recognize the roles you saw in your parents, the deficits and the pluses, all those things that you saw in your parent and really maybe start that conversation with, okay, let's back it all the way up. How was money handled in your home? And then listen to that. And then mm -hmm. Growing up as a child, what did you feel about money? Maybe they felt like, oh my goodness, my parents were always fighting about money. So I never want to talk about money because I equate that with fighting. And just to recognize like, what did you bring in from your family of origin? And then kind of take it to today. Okay, what are we good at? Like who's better at casting the vision and saying like, this is maybe what we should project for retirement and who's better with the day-to-day -day bookkeeping of, you know, how much money do we have, blah, blah, blah. And, and really leaning into what are we better at and supporting each other in that, whatever that role may be and trying to find as much common ground as possible, you know, like little sayings and slogans. My husband will say, we pay for our toys in cash, you know, and that's very Dave Ramsey like, you know, so mm -hmm. if we don't have the cash to pay for the toy, then I guess it's not time for the toy, whether that's the furniture set or that's a literal toy, you know. Yeah. So these kinds of mottos that that reflect your family's values. So so decide like for money, how much debt are you comfortable in? What would you get in debt over? You know, what are the cuts you can make to to get that debt out of your life? All those kinds of things get common ground there and start supporting each other and 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 really don't be married to the traditional role like okay you've got to do this i've got to do this maybe you stink at it maybe you need to switch you switch roles <laughs> you know, that, that is an okay thing arlene pelican you're amazing what a great teacher one of her books 31 days to a happy husband we hear a lot about keep the wife happy right <laughs> i need that book for sure how can people get in touch with you and connect with you Yes, you can just simply use my name, ArlenePelican.com. And I have a weekly podcast called The Happy Home. And when you're on ArlenePelican.com, you can look for, I have a free webinar that's called Get Unstuck in Your Marriage. And that's a great way to learn more how we can just take that next step in our marriage. Good stuff. You can find all that online, RoxanneandAce.com. And also each and every week, know that you can find us on all platforms. So wherever you're streaming, subscribe that way you don't miss next week's episode and the next and the next and then go back and listen to what you missed in the past if you're coming on for the first time but uh, we love being able to spend time with you each and every friday so thanks for hanging out and have a great weekend roxanne i love you i love you benches you've been listening to roxanne and ace unlimited to make sure you don't miss future shows you can subscribe anywhere you like to podcast and catch up on anything you've missed Find out more at RoxanneandAce.com. Roxanne and Ace Unlimited is a production of Spacebird Media.